yeah. that the only times when I've had issues around being trans and pregnant has been from other people never from myself or my own feelings just other people's kind of language or or attitudes or wow. um, misconceptions assumptions things mm. like that you know so it hasn't all been smooth sailing hello and welcome to the 50 shades of gender podcast we get curious about all things gender sex and sexuality as well as relationships feminism the inclusive kind mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. If you like what we do and want to support this podcast, you can become a patron on Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender, as in F-I-F-T-Y. You can also buy us a coffee or make a donation. Links are on the website. You can now register your interest for our upcoming allyship course, Go to 50shadesofgender.com forward slash allyship hyphen course or navigate to the course page via the website menu to be notified when it goes live. Now join us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I am a queer woman and my pronouns are she and they. In this episode, I have a conversation with Fabian Webb Brown, who is a clinic nurse specialist in the NHS and appreciator of TV, films, books, music, theatre and art. Fabian's pronouns are he and him, and he is a transgender man. Find out what that means to Fabian in this episode. We also talk about transitioning in your teenage years, what it's like to be pregnant as a trans man, accessing reproductive care while navigating an outdated system that doesn't distinguish between sex and gender, and becoming comfortable in your gender identity. It was recorded on the 13th of April, 2023. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? Hello, uh, my name is Fabian. Hello, Fabian. Welcome. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> the labels you gave me, or the label basically, was um, trans man, transgender man. So um, let's let's dive straight in there, <laughs> as, as it were. Um, yeah, so what what's your gender journey been like? Well, I came out when I sort of fully when I was about 16 mm -hmm. um, and I'd kind of started to uh, think about or, or understand that, that I was trans in the few years prior to that, maybe from about 13, 14, mm. um, when I, I started going to, I had a, a friend um, who was openly gay and who kind of dragged me along as a, as a moral support to some kind of uh, like an LGBT youth group. Um, that did meetups in London and I went along to that and that was the first time that I really encountered trans people and understood that it was even a thing prior to that I'd always thought that I was just a bit weird like just didn't really fit in with girls mm. I, I I always felt just really uncomfortable um, but I couldn't really put words to it or um, an explanation mm. to it I just knew that I'd something didn't feel quite right and then like I say over the course of a few years I kind of thought about it and and wondered if that could be it or, or not and kind of didn't want it to be because it all sounded a bit stressful and complicated but eventually came to the conclusion that yes I was trans and that I needed to do something about it if I wanted to have any hope of feeling more comfortable with myself so I came out I got a referral to what well, so the the system was kind of a bit different when I came out because it was um for how it works now but I went initially to a uh, kind of my mum paid for a private counseling just to kind of talk about my feelings and that counselor then referred me to um Tavistock like the youth gender identity service um, and I went there for about a year and a half or something like that and then I got referred on to Charing Cross the adult service and um, got hormones and which I started in 2013 and then I had top surgery there were a few delays I had the university and I did a nursing course and you basically cannot have time off from a nursing course because there are required hours that you have to meet mm. in order to actually qualify 
as a nurse. And so um, I had to delay my surgery. And then when I thought I was going to get it, I was ill and had to postpone it even longer. So in the end, in 2018, I got top surgery. Um, wow, yeah. And um, I've just kind of gradually over the years become more comfortable, I guess, in my gender identity and more relaxed about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that when you first come out, there's this big fixation on obviously wanting people to see you as Mm -hmm. you know the gender that you know you are but maybe don't of course come across that way to people who first encounter you Mm -hmm. um but the more that I've kind of progressed with my gender journey actually the less I am kind of bothered about that and I suppose part of that is probably the fact that the majority of people that meet me do perceive me as male straight away mm-hmm. um, or wouldn't misgender me or anything. So it's obviously easy for me to say now oh, it doesn't matter, but I do feel like I'm more relaxed. And even though I still consider myself to be a binary trans man, I don't necessarily view that in quite such a rigid way as what maybe I did when I first came out and was very obsessed with looking male and acting male and dressing male and walking male and talking male and now like I don't care about any of that (laughs) um you know I will do things that may be perceived as feminine or wear things that might be perceived as more feminine and like I just don't Mm -hmm. really care anymore and I think that part of that is just becoming more comfortable with with who I am and being around people that support me and Mm. you know support who I am so yeah yeah, I think that's about it (laughs) yeah that sounds that sounds good so basically you came out when you were about 13 you say you started transitioning about 16 yeah so well so I started kind of um internally questioning my gender and maybe talking about it to a couple of people maybe mostly privately sort of online Mm -hmm. um, on forums and things like that Mm -hmm. um and it was at 16 that I kind of fully came out. I just kind of went from no one knowing to telling everyone all at once pretty much right. in the space of like a couple of weeks. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it kind of all happened. I was like, well, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, I may as well just go for it. So, mm. yeah, totally, totally. So, um, yeah, I just wondered, because you transitioned or started your transition in your teens, you know, there's a lot mm. of talk about, you know, that kind of thing, like with hormones for kids and all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you know what it's like. Um, So I just wondered, like, were you at an age when you're 16, did you still need hormone blockers first or could you go on testosterone where where you're at? So I sort of missed the boat for hormone blockers, to be honest, because by the time I came out and then was referred on to the to the youth service I was already like I say about 16 17 I can't remember exactly but Mm -hmm. obviously I'd kind of already gone through the majority of puberty by Mm -hmm. that point so there wasn't really much benefit to blockers at Mm -hmm. that point so they just referred me directly to the adult service and so when I started hormones I was probably it was just after I started university so I must have been about 19 20 so I was I was no longer a a child when I when I started on hormones Mm -hmm. and I know that uh, I don't know if it's still the case now but I know that around the time when they came out it was possible to get hormones from 16 but it's never been any earlier than that Mm -hmm. that people can actually take you know they Mm -hmm. you can get hormone blockers but not actually like testosterone or um, estrogen prior to that yeah Um, and it's Mm. not it's not easy to do and certainly surgery of any kind is not possible before the age of 18 so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. good well yeah. let's let's establish that then shall we <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so what was it like sort of when you were younger when you were a younger kid you said you just felt a bit weird mostly sort of what, yeah what in in what sort of way can you say a bit more about that I think just in the sense that I was um never just never really a, a girly girl I I didn't necessarily when I was a child think oh I'm not a girl or right. I, I you know some people obviously know from a very young age or you know mm. um will identify with um another gender from a very young age but I I never really felt that and I think that was mainly because actually as a young child my parents were very 
you know, they they never kind of enforced particular dress codes or mm. toys or ways of playing or anything on me or my sister. So mm. we were left to kind of do what we wanted. And uh, and I think that it was mainly when I started secondary school and started puberty that I started to just get this general sense of discomfort and also when people started making comments um I guess when I was in primary school no one seemed to care that I wore baggy jeans and baggy t-shirts I would wear like all my dad's old t-shirts that came down like halfway down my thigh or whatever you know like giant size t-shirts um and when I went to secondary school people started to comment more on that I remember you know I eventually kind of gave in and uh you know asked my mum to buy me a bra because people would make comments because I I didn't wear one you know and people Mm. were starting to tease me about it or you know whatever I say that it was weird yeah and and kind of went through maybe a a few years between like I say maybe about 13 14 and uh, and 16 well I was still kind of questioning my gender but actually trying harder to fit into more of a binary female kind of presentation so I would I did try dressing a bit more I was never like I say it was never that girly but a little bit more wearing slightly more fitted clothes you know and things Mm -hmm. like that and I just always felt horrifically uncomfortable um and I remember like yeah is that was that to do with puberty and stuff as well did that make you feel yeah yeah I think it, it just you know like not being happy with my body was just like not feeling comfortable in my body really it wasn't even at that point this kind of strong feeling of I'm a boy I'm a man I'm not a a girl I'm not a woman Mm. it was just you know my body doesn't feel right I feel just like weird and uncomfortable in myself Mm. um, and didn't really know how to kind of articulate it more than that to be honest but I remember I remember it kind of all came to a head and the reason why I came out when I did is because I went to an all-girls school and I came out when I got to sixth form which was a mixed sixth form and I remember at the at my sort of year year 11 year 12 I can't remember what what year but you know the end of secondary school before I started sixth form um we had like a leavers party type thing and everyone turned up you know in their sparkly dresses and because th- of it was an all yeah. girls school so it was all girls there mm-hmm. all in their you know tight fitted party frocks and I was there mm-hmm. in like jeans and a t-shirt and I remember just like going into the hallway and crying and being like I don't know what's mm-hmm. wrong with me but I just feel like horrible and it was at that point that I thought like I need to you know I need to just go for it and tell people and and mm-hmm. see if it helps and obviously it it did because I'm a lot lot happier now than I was than I was back then so yeah yeah gosh that's good yeah so the picture you sent me was very it was it was very funny and it it was not unusual as such but your t-shirt said not all pregnant people are women yes yeah and um, yes, so you you are you are pregnant, and I, I just thought that was that was such an interesting subject to talk to you about because yeah. yeah. So how I mean, have you always wanted to be a parent, and have you always maybe also, and if so, have you always wanted to carry child yourself? And how do you feel about it all? What is it? What has it been like? Mm. Yeah. So um, definitely I've always known that I wanted children um, Mm -hmm. and that's always something that I've been certain of. When I came out and when I started on testosterone, I I mean, what I know now is that actually, although there's very limited research, there is nothing to suggest that being on testosterone has any impact on, on fertility while once you're once you've stopped taking it so obviously whilst you're on it it has an impact on on fertility because it interferes with the hormones that you need to get Mm -hmm. pregnant and maintain a pregnancy but once you Mm -hmm. come off testosterone that's no longer the case but at the time when I started hormones that wasn't really something that you got told you got told you have to understand when you start hormones you will be infertile you won't be able to 
have children biological children and that's what they they would tell you back then hopefully they don't now but certainly at the time when I started hormones that was the message that I was given and so I had to basically accept that I wouldn't have biological children um that must have been a I did. choice like yeah it was I mean, either yeah it was either that or like being true to yourself and being your authentic self so it sounded yeah. like it was a real clash yeah so I I looked into egg storage and and now which is great I, I don't know if it's everywhere but certainly I I hear more and more frequently that actually when people are starting on hormones that pe- that people are having this discussed more and being given options around sort of egg harvesting and storage and things like that and the same Mm -hmm. for um trans women being given the option to store sperm and things like that so Mm -hmm. i I, again i don't know how consistent that is it's probably a bit of a postcode lottery like fertility services are in general but at Mm -hmm. least it's something that is being kind of talked about more or recognized Mm -hmm. as important when i started testosterone I did explore it sort of on my own and I went to a clinic and the only way that I would have been able to afford to do it because it wasn't covered by the NHS at that point for people in my situation was to do something called egg sharing where you basically have your eggs harvested and then they store some of them for you and that you basically get that done for free in return for donating half of your eggs so that they would be given uh, and that's still something that people can do nowadays as well Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately the clinic that I went to decided that it wasn't ethical to allow someone who was planning to transition to donate eggs because egg donation is anonymous and therefore families wouldn't have an informed choice to accept an egg donation from someone that was trans Mm. and therefore if the child in future wanted to find out about who had donated the egg you know find out about their biological parent they might be upset to discover that that person was a man and not a woman you know so yeah obviously Mm. (laughs) not not great to be told that news after having gone through the whole process actually being quite open about my situation yeah and they'd never suggested that it was an issue and then at the last minute kind of sprung on me actually we've taken it to our ethics committee and they say that say no basically so I kind of just accepted well you know it is what it is and kind of was fine with the idea of adopting I never really thought that Obviously, at the start, I never really thought that it was possible for me to carry or have biological children after yeah. having been on testosterone. Yeah. As years went on, I found out that, in fact, it was possible and saw that people did do it, but didn't necessarily think it was something that I would want to do or be comfortable with. Mm-hmm. But as I mentioned earlier, my kind of feelings around my gender and how comfortable I am with myself and with my body has changed so much over the sort of what's it been now 13 14 years that I've been out Mm. and so I I'd kind of always thought adoption would probably be easier and Mm. um Mm. that I was fine with the idea of adoption but then I thought you know what actually having a baby myself is probably actually the easiest option <laughs> you know you don't have to go through all the checks and the the, mm-hmm. the long-winded process that the adoption entails and although it's um you know still I think an equally viable and great option when mm-hmm. my partner and I spoke about it we felt between the two of us that we would like to try and have a biological child that was you know from both of us and thought it was we were quite you know in quite a unique position to be able to do that because Mm -hmm. obviously a lot of queer couples can't because they Mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the you know compatible 
uh, reproductive systems to be able to do that essentially okay. yeah um yeah. you know regardless of their their gender identity the but the fact that my so my partner's non-binary and I'm obviously a trans man but mm-hmm. um between us we had the right equipment so to speak to try <laughs> and um yeah. conceive a child naturally without having to pay for any kind of fertility treatments um, and without having to go through you know any kind of assessment process or anything so we just thought why not give Mm -hmm. it a go Mm -hmm. Um, and I was initially a little bit apprehensive about how I'd feel I kind of thought you know it's a process I'll just have to go through and deal Mm -hmm. with and cope with Um, but actually weirdly I found it quite a positive and quite a like affirming experience for my gender and actually um, Mm -hmm. like haven't felt dysphoric about like the changes that my body has gone through or anything I was worried about stopping testosterone and obviously my body changing with pregnancy but Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know I wouldn't say pregnancy is enjoyable overall. <laughs> I've got plenty of gripes about how physically taxing it is on the body and mm-hmm. I feel pretty rubbish sometimes. Yeah. But it's never been in relation to my gender or dysphoria or anything like that. In yeah. fact, the only times when I've had issues around being trans and pregnant has been from other people, never from myself or my own feelings, just other people's kind of language or or attitudes or um, misconceptions, assumptions, things Mm. like that, you know, so it hasn't all been smooth sailing, but um, yeah what what do you reckon is the most, uh, the most common misconception then that you've had to deal with in this sort of journey? I mean, I think really it's what my t-shirt says that not all pregnant people are women and so you know even like if I walk into an appointment and things like that sometimes people are confused and aren't quite sure why I'm there you know and it's understandable because of course the admin staff for example who are working on the the reception and checking people into their appointments probably think that I've come to the wrong department and that I've got confused and I'm trying to go to an appointment elsewhere Mm -hmm. I don't expect them to be psychic and and know straight away so it it doesn't really phase me but obviously I have had some slightly awkward conversations I've had some I have a lot of funny looks when I'm sat in a busy waiting room where you can just feel like all the eyes on you especially now that I'm visibly pregnant Mm -hmm. before I could kind of get away with people probably assuming that I was a partner waiting, you know, Mm. just in the waiting room. But now it's obvious that I'm the pregnant one, Mm -hmm. maybe not out and about in the street, but when you're sitting in, you know, uh, antenatal clinic with a giant pregnant looking belly, people are going to start to think, actually, hang on, is that (laughs) person over there? pregnant and but they look like a man like what's going on are they a man or they like what's happening I'm really confused and so Mm -hmm. you know naturally people are are curious but it it does become a little bit uncomfortable when people are like very blatantly staring at you Mm -hmm. or we went for a scan the other day and there were two people that were very clearly talking about us Mm -hmm. um you know we couldn't hear what they were saying but it was obvious that they were talking about me and my partner and kind of looking at us while kind of having a bit of a a bit of a chat obviously wondering what was going on so yeah Yeah. it's just it's a bit uncomfortable but ultimately you know at the end of it we get our baby and I honestly just don't really care because I'm not going to see any of them ever again and I I just hope that you know during the, the process despite things not having always been perfect that people will just be a little bit more aware in future I guess so you know those admin staff will now realize actually maybe not every person that walks in who doesn't look like a woman is in the wrong place maybe they are pregnant and maybe they have an appointment and Mm -hmm. you know so not to assume or you know things like we went to some antenatal classes and the instructor spoke to us about you know the language that she used in the class and how to be more inclusive with the language she was using instead of saying you know women or mums every time you know so you know it's it's nice to know that we've kind of maybe made a few people think along the way and of course we're not going to change everyone's attitudes I know that there are people that probably think what we're doing is weird or or wrong or Mm. or people that just flat out don't 
accept that that I'm a man. You know, I'm not. I, I'm under no <laughs> no kind of delusion about my biological sex, as they will, you know, biology, biology, as they will love to, you know, go on about. on about. Yeah. I, I'm perfectly aware. I'm a nurse. I'm, I have quite a good understanding of human anatomy. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm aware that, you know, you need a uterus to get pregnant and that I have one. And I know, you know. And so here you are. <laughs> and yeah. for some people, they will never accept that that means that I can be a man. And that's fine. That's mm. if they want to think that, then they can think that. But it's not going to change how I see myself and how the people that matter <laughs> see me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's all a bit arbitrary, really. People can argue about biology or about the, the language, but, mm. you know. Yeah. I, I am pregnant. There's no denying it. I have the scans to prove it. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and obviously it's not just trans men, but there are other people who wouldn't identify as a woman, but who could be pregnant. So people that are mm. on other parts of the, the gender spectrum. Yeah. And so, yeah, and I, yeah, that, that I saw the t-shirt and knew that I needed, <laughs> I needed <Okay>. it. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what's it been like, um, besides that you've mentioned it a little bit, but like in the in the healthcare system? Because I think, do they not distinguish between sex and gender? So did you have any issues that so, you ran into there? Yeah, so the biggest issue that we've had with the, with the sort of healthcare side of things, um, all of the actual healthcare professionals, I've got to say, have been fantastic, considering that the hospital that we are going to, it seems like we are the first gender non-conforming couple that has ever passed through their service which is surprising to me to be honest given the size of the hospital and and the fact that it's quite a quite a highly rated you know popular place to go for maternity services so Mm -hmm. um, but you know as far as I can tell we're the first couple but actually everyone that we've encountered we've got a fantastic midwife the doctors have been fantastic when I was admitted for those three days they were really accommodating um, and everyone was really respectful I didn't get any weird comments or anything like that but the the biggest the biggest gripe that I have really is with the IT and the kind of yeah the IT Mm -hmm. basically so the hospital use a particular computer system the software is called Cerna (laughs) and um, this is a software that's used by many hospitals all across the UK and probably elsewhere as well I'm told that they're they're an American company so I'm guessing probably across the US as well this system is used Mm -hmm. and it's basically just the the system where patient notes are held electronically where all the appointments are booked into electronically and everything like that um so they have no choice but to use it because that's how they keep track of you know appointments and who's on their who's on their books and everything but for some reason whoever has built this software has decided to put certain limitations on it when you book appointments and so essentially when you're booking an appointment uh, into any kind of antenatal appointment so things like ultrasounds or midwife appointments or um, you know the consultant obstetricians if your NHS number because NHS numbers have a have a sex attached to them basically male or female and mine is male okay. because I've had it male on my NHS record for years and years now mm-hmm. um, and this computer system basically blocks men from being booked into antenatal appointments so it physically just doesn't let them do it so I had a lot of issues when I first referred myself to the hospital for for care Mm. um, because they basically just told me they couldn't they couldn't do it they couldn't book me into the appointment so I had a bit of a panic and I essentially put in a formal complaint Mm. um, citing institutional discrimination which I'm sure probably they see that and think "Uh oh and so within 24 hours I'd had a few calls with various people and I had an appointment booked but unfortunately the only way that they were able to do that is to essentially it's it's all a bit complicated but in simple Mm. terms they've basically disconnected my NHS record from like the 
wider kind of healthcare system so Mm. it's kind of they've like almost downloaded my NHS record just onto their system and and cut it off so it's not connected to the to anything else like my GP and then they've manually gone in and changed my sex on their computer system back to female Mm. so so that they're able to book me into appointments it's not an ideal wow solution because obviously it means that now everything that they print off like patient labels and anything will list me as female mm. but it's the only way to for them to be able to book me into the appointments at the moment mm. um and apparently it's being looked into or you know they've reported the issue to the software developer but i highly doubt it's particularly high on their list of mm. um things to look at so at the moment that's what's had to happen and it's a it's you know it is what it is but it's a bit frustrating for other reasons too things like I changed GPs and because my records disconnected on their system it didn't you know it didn't um, update and so they were sending all my kind of clinic letters and things to my old GP instead of my new GP and so I had to again contact like specific people to get it manually updated. So yeah, it's just been a bit of a wow. nightmare. But yeah. um sound it. Yeah, so it's just like the logistical stuff more than mm. anything, really. Mm. The actual healthcare staff have been great. Yeah. And I mean you're you're a nurse, so you know the yeah. system relatively well, I'd say. Yeah, we actually no, use the same computer been... system at the hospital where I work. So Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that sounds wild. Yeah, it's very frustrating. But, you know, Mm -hmm. again, it's, it's one of those things that I'm like, well, you know what, we just have to, we just have to get on with it. Mm -hmm. And we've obviously addressed it, we've complained, people Mm -hmm. say that they're looking into it, I will continue to follow it up. I think a lot of hospitals have them, but the hospital where we're at has something called maternity voices partnerships. It's basically like a, almost like a patient focus group where you can go and feed back about your experience of maternity services. And they actually mm. have the hospital where we are, have one coming up specifically for LGBT families. Mm-hmm. So I'm planning to go along to that and again, express the less than ideal situation with their computer system. And I hope that like the more people that I tell, yeah. the more people will be kind of trying to do something about it Mm -hmm. because obviously it's not just at this hospital it's any hospital that has this same computer system System, yeah must have this same problem so it's quite like a an important thing I think for them to to sort out Mm -hmm. (laughs) um Mm -hmm. but yeah I don't know I'd say yeah yeah what what can people do if they want to you know be helpful you know in this way what would you recommend anything like I, I honestly I don't the the problem is it's it's down to the software developer like this the hospital have really tried to do the best that they can in yeah. this circumstance I suppose mm. the only alternative they could have done would have been to like manually do everything for me off of their computer system but that doesn't feel very safe because then you know my appointments might get missed or they might not be able to send me my results and or things like that I don't know so it just didn't Mm. seem it seemed easier to just what use the work around that they had so I think what needs to happen is that the people that have developed this software need to take note of the problem and they need to change the way that they've designed their software so that Mm. it doesn't have this weird limit like I don't even really understand the purpose of having it there because you know yeah. the worst that would happen is a man who isn't pregnant might accidentally get booked but why would someone book book someone that wasn't pregnant into a mm. appointment for like a midwife you know like it just, I just don't understand why yeah, it's not, it's not, <laughs> why it needs to be there like blocking that I mean if they if they're doing it to prevent errors that's one mm. thing but it sounds like there should be there should yeah. be a way to bypass that yeah even if it was just a thing that flagged up saying oh you know you're trying to book yeah. a man in are you sure yeah that that would be fine but the way that they've just flat out stopped it from even being possible to do or override is it just seems a little bit mm. I don't know like extra effort on their part that they didn't <laughs> they didn't need to have programmed in there but mm-hmm. yeah we'll mm-hmm. see fingers crossed it might change in the future but yeah I'm not not getting my hopes up for it to be done any time particularly mm-hmm. soon yeah 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 gosh because I mean what what you've 
done is or what you've had to do to get into the system it's obviously helped you get in the system but it's then had you know like it's caused other problems you know so yeah not ideal is it I'm and I'm like relatively thick skinned and relatively kind of like I say quite confident in like my gender yeah. identity my gender expression so it doesn't really faze me to see like female written on a label or, or something like that I've just kind of been like oh well whatever but obviously for some people that would be really distressing yeah so totally. and, and that with coming off testosterone I suppose yeah. you know that might have its own yeah negative for, effects as well. like for a lot of people yeah. I know for, I've been I've been lucky like I say because for me it's actually been quite a like a positive like affirming experience being pregnant but I know that that's not everyone's experience and that some people do yeah. feel a lot of dysphoria and do see it very much as a like means to an end like this is just something that I have to do yeah to be able to have yeah. the child that I want to have and they have mm-hmm. a really horrible time of it and in that situation that might be the thing that makes them feel a hundred times worse seeing female written on a, a label or a wristband exactly. or something so yeah, it just um, it seems a shame that that's the only way to currently mm. work work around yeah. the issue. But yeah, wow. Um, I was reminded though of um, slightly different tangent, yeah. but like the film is a film called Seahorse. I don't know if you've seen it. It's the, about... Yeah, the documentary. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What did you think? I haven't seen it myself. Just for it was pleasure. it was really interesting. I think it was just nice to see another you know another perspective or uh, someone else's experience and obviously they in that documentary uh freddie who's the the guy that's um going through that in the show Mm -hmm. um does it by a different route Mm -hmm. using a fertility clinic and um is obviously in it he's in a different situation to me and and it but it was very interesting to watch and i guess just see someone else go through it and it just proves or proved to me that actually just as much as any other pregnant person pregnant trans people have very different experiences very different perspectives Mm -hmm. very different feelings and emotions around pregnancy Mm -hmm. um, and are just as diverse in pregnancy as anyone else really because Mm. I found that actually even though it was really like an interesting documentary to watch that I didn't relate to much of the Mm. much of the experience yeah myself like we we had just very different you know very Mm -hmm. different journeys which which is normal because that's the same as anyone else that's pregnant would have the same thing but but I thought it was interesting you know yeah that's such a good point isn't it because it might be tempting for people who look at like a minority group of people and then assume they're all having the same experience of this mm. particular thing you know which is yeah. never the case obviously is it yeah yeah is there anything you want to add that we haven't talked about yet maybe when it comes to gender or even pregnancy or care or anything like that um not that I can think of I, I feel like Fair I've enough. spoken a bit about both things yeah. I don't think we've missed we've missed much and that's pretty much so my either. life at the moment pre- pregnancy so <laughs> yeah. not much else going on yeah yeah so when is your due date your official um date? so due date is the 3rd of June however uh we are unlikely to get that far I think um mm. we've been told that I'm at increased risk of preterm labor so I'm currently 32 weeks um, and at the moment no no rumblings no sign of anything happening imminently Mm -hmm. but we have been told obviously it could kind of happen anytime Mm -hmm. so between now and the 3rd of June (laughs) could be could be uh, you know at any point really Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been um advised to kind of take it easy mm-hmm. um not go too far from the hospital so that if anything did start happening we could get in mm-hmm. pretty pronto we've got a hospital bag next to the front door so that we You're can just set. kind of grab it and run yeah, yeah, yeah. so we're very prepared um mm-hmm. and just hoping that baby stays in there as long as possible so they can you know mm-hmm. grow and get nice and strong um mm-hmm. but um the 
prognosis for babies born at sort of 32 weeks and beyond is actually really good. Sometimes they need a little bit of breathing support just because their lungs are slightly underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. But usually that's very short term and and they can go home quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So actually feeling feeling quite relaxed but it's just a bit strange you know there's already quite a lot you know they say you know you've got a due date but it's actually like a four week window any time between 38 Mm -hmm. and 42 weeks and now we've got a a Mm. 10 week window (laughs) between 32 and 42 weeks when Mm. this baby could show up at any point and we just don't know so Mm. it's um it's only been interesting um having to plan work and other things around mm-hmm. around that but um yeah but yeah so yeah I was thinking about like gender roles and parenting and stuff mm. you know what is <laughs> I don't know do you have have you thought about anything like you know once the baby's arrived how are you going to arrange and do things and sort things out yeah well I, I mean so I when 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 baby's born as as far as like sort of parental roles i very much consider myself a dad despite what the birth certificate will unfortunately say in the uk uh, and other countries as well legally i oh. have to go on the birth certificate as mother because really? the birthing parent that's just what the, the birth certificate will say mm-hmm. um and my partner despite being non-binary will have to go on the birth certificate as father because again just how it works here Mm -hmm. um which is a bit ridiculous but um gosh but yeah so but I very much consider myself a dad um the a father you know I don't see myself as a mum or a mother yeah despite having been the one to carry the baby Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my partner definitely doesn't see themselves as a a dad or a father yeah so um you know we're going to have a slightly unconventional um family yeah. set up yeah. our plan for the the child re- I mean we're both very very much going to be hands-on involved parents mm-hmm. um and the the child we haven't found out the sex whilst I've been pregnant because yeah we don't think it matters um, right. because, you know, yeah. you know, we know more than more than many people that actually what body the child has has no bearing on actually who they might be as mm-hmm. they get older. So it doesn't really tell us anything yeah. interesting, to be honest. Totally. Um, but also it will be obviously it will be a fun surprise when when the baby's born mm-hmm. to, to know that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we plan to sort of um, not raise the child gender neutral in the in the broader sense of like not enforcing particular Mm. toys or clothes or anything like that on them but we will use gendered pronouns that that kind of align with their sex assigned sex at birth Mm -hmm. but raise them in a way where they obviously understand my gender identity and my partner's gender identity and would feel comfortable Mm -hmm. telling us at any point if they no longer thought that those pronouns or the gender that they were kind of being raised as Mm. um, fit with how they were feeling but we just feel that I, I, I mean I completely respect people that can raise their children gender neutral but I think I would find it very difficult Mm -hmm. and I would worry especially coming from a already an unconventional family Mm -hmm. that it would just cause more problems for our child growing up if Mm -hmm. you know people Mm -hmm. were questioning their gender before they even really understood the concept of gender so it just seems easier to you know do it in a way that they know that they can tell us at any point Mm -hmm. if it doesn't seem right but not to kind of open them up to questioning and interrogation from other people when you know the reality is the majority of people will be cisgender and will identify with Mm -hmm. you know yeah their their gender as you know as they're raised or their sex is assigned at birth so you know we're obviously open to the possibility that that won't be the case but we that that's sort of our plan at the moment is to just um mm. 
kind of raise them in a very open way so that they're very comfortable to talk to us, but not um, not kind of actually raising them uh, fully gender neutral, i.e. using sort of gender neutral pronouns and not telling people mm. their their sort of assigned sex at birth and, mm. and, and things like that, just because, you know, I don't know, I have nightmares about... <laughs> weird people who are overly curious trying to find you know find out or investigate you know because they are desperate I don't know why people are so weirdly obsessed with you know pretty much any time I tell anyone I'm pregnant that's their first question oh are you having a girl or are you having a boy and I'm like yes (laughs) I'm having a baby (laughs) yes having a baby yes I I, you know it's just it's just such a weird it's just such a weird thing and I I get why people ask it's like yeah you don't know much else about a baby before they're born do you so I kind of understand why Mm -hmm why it's something people ask or it's just like you know a conversation starter I suppose but but people just really do seem very fixated on it so I don't want to yeah I don't want my child to have to (laughs) be constantly interrogated when they're growing up when they don't even understand what Mm -hmm. gender is Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and when they do understand what gender is if they feel like their gender is different than what we've kind of you know said then they will they will tell us and totally. you know yeah we'll cross that bridge if and when we come to it that's right yeah totally yeah well yeah if you have nothing else to add then we can wrap it up there so thank okay. you thank you very much for sharing yeah you're very welcome thank you for thank you for having me it's been been nice to chat about really yeah good You can find out more details on the website at 50shadesofgender.com forward slash Fabian, where you can also read the transcript. And you can find Fabian on Instagram. Links are on the website. Thank you for listening to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. You can find us online at 50shadesofgender.com, on social media and on YouTube. Again, if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 Shades of Gender. You can also buy us a coffee or make a donation. Links are on the website. Remember to register your interest for our upcoming allyship course. Go to 50shadesofgender.com forward slash allyship hyphen course or navigate to the course page via the website menu to be notified when it goes live. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open-minded.